All right, we are live. Hi, everybody. You may have noticed that this is not Kevin Tomlinson. This is Jim Azevedo. Kevin was Kevin was having a little bit of a technical uh, technical difficulty signing in, so I'm going to join until Kevin's able to join here. I'm going to click off my window here for just a second. Let's see, get rid of that because I've got this huge echo going. Okay, so welcome to Self Publishing Insiders. I appreciate all of you joining. Joining me today, or joining us today, I'm thrilled to welcome Lori <laughs> McLean from the San Francisco Writers Conference. Lori, thanks so much for being here. I am thrilled to be here. This is my first uh, live stream of the year. So let's kick it off and make it really great, Jim. What do you think? I think, yes, let's do that. <laughs> um, now, originally we talked about this. We talked about, um, we talked about talking about the San Francisco Writers Conference, but your history is also pretty interesting. So if you wouldn't mind, Lori, could you kind of take us back a little bit and tell us about your your history, not just in the publishing industry, but even before that, because you knew uh, Mark Coker from Smashwords back from the Silicon Valley public relations world going back, dare I say, decades? Oh, my God, yes. Well, the first time I met Mark <laughs> in the publishing industry, he said, wait a minute, are Lori McLean, are, are you the Lori McLean behind McLean Public Relations? And I went, yep. Yes. And he said, I hate you and walked away. And I'm like, oh, my God, my first big like introduction to somebody in the world of publishing. So I was an agent at the time, a young agent. And uh, and then he came back. He goes, no, nah, I'm just kidding. He goes, I, I lost so much business to you. You were always beating us out on clients. I'm like, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> but but yeah, I uh, I have I'm a lot older than I look. I was around during the early days of the microcomputer and the homebrew computing club, if you can imagine that, back in the '80s. And uh, so for 20 years, I did um, I had my own public relations and marketing firm, and we just dealt with all the biggies in the industry because we were one of the few organizations who actually loved microcomputers. There were there were a lot of older guys who would come from the electronic side of things. Yep. But um, we had Apple, Adobe, Hotmail, you know, lots of great clients. So that was really fun. That was like part one of Lori McLean's uh, background. <laughs> part one. But, What's part yeah, two? Like? Yeah, part two is publishing. So in 2005, I became an agent with Larson Pomata. That's when I met Mark at Smashwords. And, you know, it's funny because when I got into publishing, I thought, well, I could be a dilettante. This is a very slow industry. Everything moves really slowly. Yeah. And then in 2008, everything blew up because social media and self-publishing. Yeah. So when that happened, I thought, wow, I thought I had left all my tech background behind. But, you know, now I was I had a huge advantage because I already knew how disruptive technology can be in an industry that hasn't changed much in a long time. And publishing, honestly, hadn't changed in 200 years. So right. it was ripe for technology. Smashwords came along and uh, you guys were just amazing, not only in um, how you, you know, you, the distribution and the, the ease of use that you guys offered, but also in the, um, just the friendliness, you know, publishing is a very arcane and non-transparent industry. It's mm -hmm. hard to break in. Authors spend all this time uh, on their own, writing their books, and then they come to a conference or they go online right. and they start learning things about the business of publishing. And it's like slamming into a brick wall, you know, and, I, and you don't, you can't see on the other side of the brick wall. So it's very intimidating. And uh, Smashwords always you know, you and Mark always made it so friendly and it's like, oh, do you have Aww. a question? Maybe I have an answer. So it was great. Oh, well, thanks for that. And that's one of the best things about the San Francisco Writers Conference. What we'll get to, it's that welcoming environment. But I want to back up for a second, if you don't mind. Okay. I'm always, inter I'm always interested in learning how people went from one industry to a completely different industry because <laughs> my background is a little similar to yours. But a lot of folks don't know is that I knew Mark Coker way before Smashwords. 
because I, I worked in that same public relations firm that Mark owned and operated. So I met Mark Coker back in 1994. For those of you who are listening or watching and don't know who Mark Coker is, so Mark was the founder and CEO of Smashwords, um, who founded the company back in 2008, way before the acquisition, way before Drafted Digital acquired Smashwords in March of last year. So Laurie, also, I'll, so I'll get to like why I, I got in the publishing industry. It's probably pretty obvious by now. But what made you switch from high-tech PR in the Silicon Valley over to the book publishing industry? Good question. And I did ask myself that a lot for a period of two years. Um, the high-tech industry is all about change. Uh -huh. And it might be incremental change, like you've got a new widget or you've got a faster uh, piece of hardware or you've got yeah. an extra bit on your software, a new a yeah. new thing that people can try. But it's also um, so it's so it's really, really fast moving and people don't see what goes on in the background. They just see the end result. And I was just my body was killing me and my mind was <laughs> killing me. I mean, running at that fast pace for 20 years and running a business and dealing with huge CEOs of big companies, you know, and Apple would say, well, we want we're going to get into video now. So we want you to do the PR for this division. And I'm like, oh, I have to hire three more people. And then, you know, and Apple can be so secretive about their product launches. Yes. So, yes. I so after 20 years, I just really felt burnt out, to be honest. And I uh, I said, well, if I could do anything, because the other thing is the tech industry back then, they would just throw money at you, throw, throw, throw. And I had already bought a house. I was married. I was not going to have kids. I was happy. And so I'm like, do, yeah. what more do I really need? And I thought, well, what, what do I want to do? You know, if I could do anything in the world, what did I want to do? And it was write a book or write a mm -hmm. lot of books. And mm -hmm. just like, that's why I have such a soft spot in my heart for self-publishing, because it's like, I just want to publish something. I want to write it. I love characters. I love plots. I love, you know, doing all this stuff. So I want to put it together in a book. I wrote a book. I gave it to my mom for her 80th birthday. And uh, she said, wow. oh, you should get this published. And I looked up on the internet, are there any, what, how do you get published? And there was right. like, the San Francisco Writers Conference is happening in two weeks. And I'm like, so that was well, like 2005-ish? Good... Uh, yeah, 2005, exactly. Okay. So I just decided I'll go there. I knew nothing. I, I, ha I had like little bits of information, like the seven people touching the elephant. You know, I'm <laughs> like, oh, somebody said you should make a postcard of your cover. So I hacked together this really ugly cover with two of my friends acting as the <laughs> the people on the cover and <laughs> and then i had a, on the back of the postcard it's like would you like to see my manuscript oh you know shall i send it to you or no and of course all the agents said no and sent it back to me um but but it was still a great experience because you go in there this this is the trip of a writer's conference yeah you go there because so many friends family co-workers whatever are so amazed that you wrote a novel because it is a huge so undertaking true. it is that they go oh you should get this published so you go to the conference the first day and you're like i got a bestseller all i need to do is get an agent meet a couple of these editors here and uh, and i'll be done and you learn so much that you don't know. Questions you didn't even know needed to be answered. And so you get depressed. So the second day of the yeah. conference, it's everybody sitting there going like, I'm a failure already. I mean, what, <laughs> why did I think I was going to get yeah. this book published? And then after you get beaten down like that, then you realize, oh, wait a minute. I, I just have to edit it. And oh, wait, I can, I've can. i met all these people that can help yeah. me on my journey. Wait, I've got cards from eight agents who say, when you're ready, send me something. Wait, yep. this is not a total loss. So by the third day, everybody's feeling hopeful. They're starting to get their plan together. And by the fourth day, well, A, they're exhausted mentally and physically. So they just sit there and let the information stream into their brain for later access. Yep. Um so that's what I did. And I decided, you know what? I really miss using the shark part of my brain. I want to be an agent. <laughs> so I wrote two more books, but none of them have seen the light of day. And I'm glad because they're really bad. <laughs> 10 years later, I looked at them. I'm like, oh my God, this is so horrible. And I, I should tell your audience too, that I'm also a literary agent. My partner, Gordon yes. Warnock and I, Form Fuse Literary back in 2013. So 
<laughs> you know, looking at the stuff I wrote in 2002, 2003, 10 years later, I'm like, ooh, yeah, I was really green back then. I didn't know what I didn't know. And these will never see the light of day unless they have a major rewrite. Okay. I, um, I want so to touch on happened. something that you said a little. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No. Hey, I can go on for 45 minutes about my background. So please interrupt me. All right. When you and I get talking, I mean, that's that's one of the dangers. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to underscore or something that you said a little bit earlier was that I went to my first writers conference, the San Francisco Writers Conference, not knowing a thing, like totally clueless. Yeah. And I think that sometimes when writers go to writers conferences for the first time, they're kind of nervous. They're like super intimidated because there are all of these traditional publishers there. There are all of these editors there and agents and I don't know what to do and I'm afraid to talk to anybody. But conferences like the San Francisco Writers Conference offers such a welcoming environment. Like we know this, um, the large traditional publishers, yeah. the agents, the editors, even the big um, self-publishing platforms like Draft or Digital, we know this and we are thrilled that you are there because for the most part, it's not necessarily about people who have already made it. We're trying to bring up the next generation of aspiring authors to help you Absolutely. figure out how to get published, like what are the best practices? Because we're not there just to talk about what it, what it, the things that we do. We want you to go along the path the right way to make you as successful as you can possibly be. Right. And another thing about some of these conferences, like you'll see, you can back me up on this, I'm sure, Lori, <laughs> you'll see New York Times bestselling authors sitting on the floor with a bunch of writers, um, aspiring authors who haven't yet published their first book talking to them about the things that they did to get to where they are today. So totally. please don't be intimidated by uh, going to a conference. It's one of the best possible things that you can do for your career. In fact, I would say that, well, the conference started, the first year was 2004. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's 20 years old, um, give or take. Uh, we, we missed one conference because of the pandemic, but the Sweet 2021 pandemic. we did, and then 2022 <clears throat> we had it in July. So we're kind of skirting the edges of it there. But um, what was I going to say? Oh, we made a concerted effort since we moved from the Mark Hopkins Hotel, which was a gorgeous historical hotel, yeah. but it, we just outgrew it and it was away from everything. So we moved it down to the Hyatt Regency, which is right by the Embarcadero, the Ferry Building, you know, the business district, tons of restaurants, everything from, you know, McDonald's up to a Michelin starred restaurant within yep. walking distance. And, um, the, my co-director, Lisa Provost, and I decided, let's let's rethink everything. How can we make it even friendlier? And so we used to have this one thing called speed dating with agents. It was just a legacy. You know, mm -hmm. nobody, everybody liked it, but it was terrifying. It happened on Sunday morning. So you had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, to just get so nervous you were going to throw <laughs> up, you know, on the agent. Um, and we had all the agents sitting in a room and you get in a line. You get more and more nervous as you approach the agent. Then you approach the agent, you sit down, and you have three minutes to describe yeah. your life, your career, your book, everything else. And we it's said a little nerve wracking. It, yeah, I'm like, is that really the best way to do it? So this year, what we've done is with the price of the conference, you get I think it's four, um, you get four um, eight minute chats, for lack of a better word, one with an agent one with an acquiring editor. I mean, I, I invited all the agents and editors this year and I picked the editors as younger ones who actually are open to acqu acquiring stuff. So acquiring editor, which is different from an indie editor, which an indie editor you hire to help mm -hmm. edit your work, which I'm sure a lot of self-publishers do yeah. because look, you can't even find your own typos, let alone know when what needs to be changed in the middle of the book if it's a little soft or yeah. a character that's not acting true to form. Um, so it's a literary agent. You get an appointment with a, an acquiring editor, an indie editor, and a PR pro or book coach. We don't have a lot of those, so we kind of push them together. But all those are included. So you just have to go look at all the... Um, resumes or the bios and the manuscript wish list yeah. of the agents and acquiring editors and say, I want Lori McLean. And I've got four hours of consultations I'm taking. So that's really cool. And that's yeah. new for this year for 2023. Is that correct? It's brand new for this year because we wanted it to be less um, stress inducing. 
And, and Liz has come up with other things too, to make it even more friendly. And everybody I invited, all the agents and editors mm -hmm. are, you know, the question I asked them is, are you going to hang out at the conference and talk to people in an impromptu manner? And it's not necessarily like I'm an agent. Well, maybe I, I do, I um, represent all genre fiction. So maybe mm -hmm. you've got memoir. Guess what? I know a lot about memoir and I know a lot about publishing. So you don't have to come up to me and say, I want to pitch you on my memoir, which will get you nowhere. That's you come up to point. me and you say, I don't know what to do next. Here's where I am. And I give you advice. Okay. You did know? you hear that authors? Like it's okay. You don't have to be perfect. You can approach these people who are, who love helping you get started. Exactly. And I was really shocked because I'd say five or six years ago, I wouldn't have been able to get one acquiring editor from a big five publisher in New York to actually, you know, do Ask a Pro, which we're doing at breakfast this year instead of uh, in the afternoon on Saturday, yeah. Saturday morning and Sunday morning. Jim, you're going to be there. there yeah, will set be my alarm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like, I'll be knocking on your door. 745. Yeah. Come down with me for coffee. Got like um, pillow wrinkles on my face. <laughs> <laughs> but you sit at the table. You got your little draft to digital sign there. Mm -hmm. And then attendees bring their breakfast over, sit down and they eat, ask you a question like, yeah. well, what do you guys do? And how do you do it? Right. And so there'll be acquiring editors there and agents there too. I'm shocked. But they all said yes. You know, part of it is we're all craving human contact so much after this pandemic. Yeah. Like this is a really good example of that. Um, but if you saw me in person, it would be more a better conversation, you know, because you might think of something or somebody else might come in and ask a question that, you know, that you didn't even know you wanted to ask, but you really are craving the answer. So anyway, it's cool. Yeah, you just made me think of something. So several years ago, <laughs> oh my head. Uh, <laughs> so several years ago, when Mark Hoger like first asked me to split some of the public speaking duties with him, you know, every cell in my body is screaming, "No!" Like, oh my god, public speaking. But one oh, thing, this I from a former or present musician, right? Well, I was <laughs> you know drummer, so I got to sit back and watch everybody else do their things. That's a whole other podcast, Lori. I know. I'm a drummer too, you know. About here. All right. Oh. That was so. my gig in the band I played with. I was okay. the percussionist. So Nice. Okay, we're going to have cool. to talk about that a little bit more All right. yeah. <laughs> during the conference. But one thing that was recommended to me that I would um, give advice to authors who may be, you know, having a little bit of jitters going to their first conference is Right. If you can show up to your speaking gig or show up um, you know, prior to your first appointment with an agent or editor, like show up at one of these breakfasts, what you'll learn is that when you start to get to know these faces and these people and you're having these informal conversations first, like almost right away, your mind is just set at ease because you're going to realize that these are all just people just like me. And not only that, they're yep. friendly people. They love doing what they're doing. They love the same things that I do. And this is going to be great. And I can almost guarantee you that you're just, you're going to be, your excitement level is going to rise so much. I do a, a bit at the end of the show with Lisa Provost called uh, taking the conference home with you. And because you learn so much there and we want to give people a path to actually apply that when they get home and, uh, and start utilizing some of the information and the techniques that they learned. And people are just buzzing with excitement, you know, like they can't almost can't sit in their chairs. They're so excited yeah. about everything that they, that they learned. And so it's, it's a really, it's a really wonderful, you know, you were a musician or are a musician. I mm -hmm. was a musician. I guess I still am, but I don't perform anymore. Once um, a musician, always a musician. Yeah, there you go. But you know, that feedback you get from the audience when oh, yeah. you're playing and they're clapping and they're dancing and everything, it really energizes you. So here I am after, you know, six months of planning the conference, four full days of doing the conference. You would think I would be a puddle of goo on the floor, <laughs> but instead those people just energize me and I come up with even more ideas on how we can be helpful. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really think that the current management group, I mean, pfft, there are six of us, so let me not be so hoity-toity here. But all six of us are so into helping people. 
And you know, oh, yeah. we were one of the, we were the first, I will say that with confidence. We were the first conference who said, we need to embrace self-publishing. So people who are self-publishing need this information almost more than the people that are traditional publishing. And you know, now you've got hybrid publishing, partner publishing. It just keeps evolving and it's it's going so fast. It's it's wonderful to see. Um right. like that's we, how the that's how the I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say we like we have a, a session on AI and publishing about chat GPT. You mm -hmm. know, I mean this is brand new. AI is you know i don't know i i do this thing in fact go to if anybody wants to go to fuse literary go to our news page it's fuse literary.com f-u-s-e literary.com and go to our news page and i uh, publish this uh, publishing predictions for 2023 which i do every january and um one of the people commented well hey you don't have anything about ai publishing that's because i don't think ai publishing is going to be real enough in 2023 to mm -hmm. really you know mean anything however what's happening is what you see in the in the beginning of a disruption which yep. is that um kids are using it in high school and college to write papers um so they don't have to write them they'll say ai write me a paper on such and such and such and such and then they just edit it so teachers are freaking out because they've got to stop this before it can get anywhere but if yep. you read some of the ai uh books that have been uh published uh horrible you know, but they're going to get better. So they're it gonna is some, get, they're going to get better. Yeah, it is something we have to look at. But we have a, a session on that uh, with people who teach about it um, at the conference on Saturday, I think. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, I like I've always enjoyed how the San Francisco Writers Conference organizes itself, because hmm. on the very first day of the conference, you have three sessions, right, that are kind of like welcome to the conference. And then here's what to yeah. expect at the conference. And then you've got the plenary session later in the afternoon that discusses uh, publishing options. And they've got folks on there who talk about self-publishing, traditional publishing, and hybrid publishing. Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, it's funny because we started thinking about what do people need? The people who come on Thursday, which is like 80% mm -hmm. of the audience, some of them have to work. So they don't come on Thursday, but they take Friday off. Okay. So Thursday afternoon, it's like, here are all the people you're going to meet. Here's what the thing looks like. Here's other things you can sign up for if you're interested. Like we have mm -hmm. master classes that are three hour intensives on one particular thing, Thursday night and Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So people might say, wow, I, I know a lot of this introductory stuff already, but I need to do that master class on pacing or on character development or on, uh, we have one on writing for Hollywood. You know, it's like, what goes into a script or a screenplay? Right. How do you sell a treatment? You know, words that people aren't even really used to hearing. So on Thursday, we really wanted it to be this, you know, 10,000 foot view and the publishing options plenary, meaning there's nothing else uh, going on except mm -hmm. this uh, panel for an hour and a half. And it's got people from different segments of the industry. So it's seven people touching the parts of the elephant. You get the whole elephant. Um, and Jim, you're on it. So you I'm can talk it. about self-publishing and what people need to know, you know, nuts and bolts to get into it. Because right. a lot of people are come to the conference, they're like, self-publishing? I don't want to do that. I want to be with Random House. And I'm like, well, first of mm -hmm. all, Random House got acquired by Penguin, you know, many yep. years ago. So it's Penguin Random House. And if you don't even know that, then you have a lot to learn, which is good because you would never go into a career and assume you know everything day one, right? Let's There's all it's a journey, like Steve Jobs said. You need to be learning all throughout it, and you know that makes it fun. But back to this publishing panel, it's um, <clears throat> it's got people who are traditional publishers, mm -hmm. and it's got people who are self publishers, and everything in between. There's hybrids now with all kinds of different you know, pay as you go model or don't pay and don't get royalties, yep. and, you know, all kinds of weird things that people need to know is out there so they can make an informed decision on how they want their career to grow. Right. And it's very respectful too. I, I like how the traditional publishers, like nobody bad mouths the other side. It's never been self-publishing yep. versus traditional publishing. We're the best, yep. best path. No, yep. because I think what, what authors, find sometimes and sometimes it's surprising to the authors themselves is that hey maybe self-publishing is not the best path for me or i was all in 100 percent to go down the traditional route find that agent find that traditional publisher and then i learned about all these different 
benefits of self-publishing, I think I'm going to do that. And so it's it's really, really eye-opening for so many folks on both sides of the aisle. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, again, we pick the traditional publishing people who also embrace self-publishing. As an agent, if I put that yeah. hat on right now, I have half of my clients who do self-publishing for some projects. And then I can sell as their agent. I can sell the foreign translation rights. I can try and get a movie deal. I can sell audio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, lot, when you self-publish, you own all your subsidiary rights. So it's nice to have a partner a business yeah. partner who can sell those. But those people also want a traditional deal. They want to be in bookstores. They want to be in airport bookstores. They want to be uh, up for awards. And those are things that's, that are really hard to do if you're self-published. So I call it hybrid, these people hybrids, mm -hmm. but that term has really changed in the past decade. So I'm not, I, I might have to come up with a different term. I feel like publishing in the future and it really is today too, is a series of rivulets of income rather than this rushing, gushing river, um, which is like, if you're Stephen King, you're a traditional publisher and that's what you do. Yep. Although he's a bad example because he's done some <laughs> publishing that is verging on self-publishing with really tiny publishers True. too. But it, okay, say you're just a big bestseller, James Patterson, he's not going to self-publish. He's going to just plop it on over to the traditional team that he has mm -hmm. at Scribner or wherever he is, Little Brown, and they're going to do everything for him because he makes them millions of dollars every year. But for the great vast majority of everybody else, um, if you can self-publish a book because maybe it's a family history that you put together because you're really into genealogy, yep. well, who, who would be interested in that if you really look at it? Your family. And wouldn't that be a great thing to have out there for your descendants? Of course it would. That's the mm -hmm. history of your family. But you don't need a traditional publisher. You self-publish it. And in fact, you might not even need to self-publish it by having it available for sale for anyone other than your family. You might just right. do a short print run yourself and hand it out to everybody for a holiday gift um, or at the family reunion, which is fine. You know, this idea that everybody has to be a bestseller is ridiculous. Yeah. I can almost guarantee you, Jim, that that is not why people got into writing books in the first place. Oh, they had a story to tell no or they had characters that were driving them nuts and they had to get, <laughs> get them out of their heads, you know, whatever it is. But then the, at some point it changes and everybody's like, wow, everybody I talk to about this book loves it so much. Right. I'm going to I'm going to be a bestseller, you know, and that's. I mean, that's a trap you could fall into early on and we'll all forgive you. But eventually mm -hmm. you need to look at this unemotionally and say, hey, I got a lot of books that I want to write. Some of them could be bestsellers, yep. maybe. Some of them could be decent sellers, probably. Yep. And some of them I just want to write because I want that story to be told. And it, maybe it's a, about a very small community and maybe I'll just take the money I earn from the other books pay for a short print run and give it out to people. I had a client who was a street preacher and he said, I said, what is your goal for your writing career? And he said, I want to get these kids in Oakland to not take up drugs or crime or whatever. I want to show them there's a different way. That's right. And I said, what if you get a foundation in Oakland or some civic organization to pay for a print run and then just give them out to the kids you see on the street and the young adults. And that's what he did. And, and those are the types of audiences that I love. It's finding those authors who had no idea that there was these different paths that they could take to get their books right. out into the world. Right. So, so that I'm just saying there's a lot of different ways you can get your message out there. Some people write because they have a message to give to the world. Mm -hmm. They want to change the world. Some people write because they just enjoy telling stories. Mm -hmm. Some people write because they're driven to it and they can't, not right. Um, right. There, there's probably as many reasons why people write as there are people writing. Right. So just get off the idea that I'm going to write in, and my career is going to go in this straight line and I'm going to, uh oh, oh, I thought I missed you for a second there. Your eyes were closed. I'm like, oh, no, I'm so paranoid that my internet's <laughs> going to go down or, or glitch, you know? <sighs> But I'm talking way too much, and and probably you no. or your people have have questions. No, this and... is good. I think you've kind of touched upon some parallels to the music industry again, in that you know when you're a creator, whether it's music or um, visual arts or writing a book, some of us have to create because we have to, and right. we're not writing a book because you feel that. 
this audience over here is going to love it. You're writing because you love writing. And then once you get to that level where your books start to sell and you start approaching that bestseller carrot, then absolutely go for it. Yep. yep. Now, one thing I want to also talk about, Lori, is that you mentioned this idea of, you know, the first day of the conference, the second day of the conference and attendees brains getting just <laughs> filled. And that's true. And that's the mark of a good conference. One thing I try to advise attendees is that don't worry, because what you're going to find is that the, the day after the conference, up to a week after the conference, all those little tidbits of information that you really, really needed to learn are going to start to kind of bubble up to the top of your brain. But if I'm an attendee at the San Francisco Writers Conference and I'm worried about missing some, some of the information or maybe there are two concurrent sessions going on at the same time, do you have the ability, are you recording any of these sessions this year? And will they be able to, to get that, that stuff? I'm telling you, we are in hive mind because I was just thinking to myself, I've got to remember to tell people that we're video recording every session and we have five simultaneous tracks going. So there's no wow. way you can see every session when you're at the session. But with your um, registration fee, you get a year of accessing all of these videos. They're on YouTube. So they're, you know, password protected. But yeah, so you can see everything. And if you, in fact, there's a few up there, I think, that are public. I don't know. I'm probably saying something that's wrong. But if if you if you don't take this as gospel, go to YouTube, look at San Francisco Writers Conference, or it might be SFWC, um, which are the initials of the first words in San Francisco Writers Conference. Um, you might be able to see um, some of the ones that we have there, because I think I don't know if plenary publishing is up there yet or something, but there, there are a few of them. And I think the keynotes that we put up there just for everybody to see, because we thought that's important for people to see the quality of um, the sessions that we offer. I'm so incredibly proud of this year. Lissa did it all herself. I mean, I invited people and we have five track coordinators who invite speakers, mm -hmm. but like we have Joyce Maynard who is amazing. She's written 18 books. Two of them have, and she's written tons of articles for everything from Vanity Fair to the New York Times. Wow. And she, um, two of her latest books were made into movies. So she's going to be speaking at a dessert keynote on, well, cookies and coffee. I guess I shouldn't overhype it here. Um, but hey, she's speaking- nothing wrong with cookies and coffee. <laughs> Some of those questions are going to be good. People eat two, three, cook those big cookies are going to come up with some real good questions for Joyce. Um, but she's speaking Friday night. And then on Saturday at lunch during the sit down luncheon, we have the two great minds behind America's next great novelist, America's next great author. Oh, and okay. uh, this is a TV show, a reality TV show. And in now, fact, has that show started? Is it? Is no, it? no, okay. I, I don't think so. But they might okay. have some news for us at the conference. I don't know. Um, in fact, they're on my list of people, you know, stars must call today. And that was from like Monday. So you can see how my life is going. But um, yeah, they started that show. They did the pilot. Um, I, I don't know if they've gotten distribution yet or not. But um, they're going to talk all about it at the keynote. And, and I'm trying to convince them to do a little like skit or something to show us, bring video or something to show us. Because one of the um, attendees from last year actually became a finalist and was invited to New York, I think, or New Jersey to actually do the pilot. That's really so, cool. Yeah. So I can't wait to see what they have to say. They do this thing called um, Pitchapalooza every year. I mean, one of them's an agent, one of them's an author and an actor. And so they do Pitchapalooza in New York and it's mm -hmm. just this huge thing where they invite tons of agents and you go there and it's just like a, a cattle call. You just start talking to agents as an author and tell them what you're doing. And wow. you probably end up with three or four agent cards who want you to send them things. So wow. yeah, they do that in New York. It's kind of like speed dating. So it is mm -hmm. incredibly stressful. We'll see what happens here with in, including the, um, the pitch sessions and everything, you know, with the registration fee. We'll see if that works. Okay. I, I have this sneaking suspicion that people like the stress. <laughs> hey, man, if I could go my whole life without stress, I'll <laughs> have at it. Um, You're right. But, it's probably just me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I, I'm fully... Uh, I recognize that it's the stress, it's those challenges that you can meet head on that's going to help you grow. 
Yeah. We're here to help alleviate some of that stress for you I when you come so. to these conferences. Um, in speaking, not necessarily of stress, but <laughs> alleviating that stress, let's let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the best practices of not just the San Francisco Writers Conference, but when you attend any conference. One thing that we mentioned earlier was you know, arriving to uh, a session or going to one of those ask a pro breakfasts and doing some of the more informal things like like networking. Um, one thing I tend to do, and this is like a little rule I made up for myself years Ooh, ago. Like this is like, an insider podcast. This is a best practice from an insider, right? So I made this little rule for myself and it was when you go to a networking party, just like it brought back those memories of high school when you come and do a party, you're like, Oh, I don't like, I don't know anybody here. I'm going to go stand over in the corner. <laughs> um, so when I've gone to uh, conferences and there are these big networking events and you can swear that everybody knows everybody, that's what it feels like. So I thought I'll give it one drink. It doesn't matter what that drink is. It could be a, a coffee uh, a water, a glass of wine, whatever, your beverage of choice, give it one drink. Just go grab that water or whatever it is. Walk around the room and I can almost guarantee you somebody will stop you and say, hey, what do you write? Is this your first conference? And then it'll just, it'll go from there. So you're that's so, one of my best practices. You're so right. And you know, um, the we changed our uh, tagline this year to learn, connect, publish. Because really, people are coming, they're spending the big bucks to go to a conference um, because they want to get published. Mm -hmm. But there's so much you have to learn, and there's so many opportunities to network when you're at a conference. I mean, it is just ridiculous. We had people say, could you do a lunch or something that doesn't have a keynote so we can all just talk to each other? Because we're, we're getting critique partners, and we're getting beta readers, and we're getting, you know people who can uh, introduce us to their agent. And we want to talk to each other as much as we want to learn from the people, you know, at the podium. Yeah. So, so we, uh, we did a thing for Friday where there is no lunch. You just go out to many, you know, go out and see San Francisco. So many of our attendees are not from here. So it's like, yeah. go out, see the beautiful city that we offer you and grab some of these people that you've just met and go have a lunch you're on your own. Grab me. I'll be there. We'll have a table, a big old sign. I'll yeah. trust me. You can find me pretty easily. I, be, I yeah, love yeah. to meet folks who come up to the conference. Well, you're going to have a booth too. So people will find you right when big you come sign. out of the ballroom. There's draft to digital. So yeah. yeah. Good location. Yeah. So I just, um, just brought up a comment from Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom says, hello, all. I'm still trying to finish cleaning up a 10 novel series. Hoping to get Whoa. noticed. Okay. So you're I ahead of the game, you. Tom, having more than one book that's ready to go. Yeah, that's good. And it's funny because if you came to the conference, you would probably learn uh, a lot about how to edit those 10 books. Um, as an agent, <sighs> all right, now I'm going to bum you out. But I'm not going to bum you out because, uh, well, you'll learn something here. As an agent, if you came to me and pitched me, I would say, um, okay, I can only pitch one book at a time yeah. to an editor. When I'm pitching that first book in the series, I want you to be writing the first book in a new series. Because if I can't sell that first book, I'm not going to be able to sell books two through 10 either right then. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say I couldn't sell them later to the person that I sold book one of the new series to. Okay. Julie Kagawa is one of my New York Times and international bestselling clients. She gave me this book 12 years ago that I thought I could sell. I'm like, this is so great. Signed her up, spent a year trying to sell it, could not sell it. And it was like anime, manga, like feudal Japan. It had magical realism in it. It was everything editors say they want. Nobody mm -hmm. wanted it. But in the meantime, she said, well, I said, write the first book of another series. And she said, but this is a trilogy. I said, I know, I know. It doesn't make sense, but just do it. Again, publishing sometimes has some weirdness to it uh -huh. that is not uh, evidenced. It's not obvious. So I told her to write the first book in a new series. She's like, well, what would that be? What's hot right now? And I said, well, you know what? Fairies are kind of hot, but not your Tinkerbell fairies. We're talking about old school fairies who will, you know, 
lure you to fairyland and keep you there forever or they'll yep. do a changeling swap and you'll get some cruddy baby that's horrible and you'll be over <laughs> in fairyland you know and so she's like mm, okay and she she realized well what do fairies not like they don't like iron well what's the equivalent of iron today technology so she mm. wrote the iron fay and it became a new york times bestseller so that was the second book i tried to pitch i sold it within three weeks after i had spent a year trying to sell this other one 10 years later the publisher that had had published all like the first 10 books that she did ended up paying six figures per book for the book that i couldn't sell 10 years wow. ago so that, that's why i say publishing is weird you never count yourself out so tom with 10 books um and i see over here i'm looking at the comments you're a sci-fi mm -hmm. novelist okay that series if your agent can't sell it be ready with, the, you know, at least an idea of what you want to write, maybe three ideas for three new series that you want to write. And you know what? If you end up self-publishing that book, that series of 10 books, that's fine. Because, dear God, my husband, he's probably in the bathtub reading right now, but he reads on his <laughs> Kindle a book a day or something. And he'll always All say, right. oh, this sci-fi series is so good, Lord, you should represent this person. And I'm like, oh, I can only represent so many people, but... It's great. I'm going to bring so up another cool. comment here from uh from okay. Naja. Hey Naja. Hi we, Naja. We... <laughs> this is outstanding. She says, "Is it a good place? Meaning the conference? Is it a good place for place for publishers to go to support our authors? Do you oh, need yeah. any speakers?" Ah, okay. Well, we're having the conference in three weeks, so we're pretty full up at this point. But we have a presenter interest form, Naja. Um. Talk to Jim after this. Do you have her yep. email address? Okay. I do. All right. Send me Naja's email address, and I will send you the link to a presenter interest form, which anybody can sign up, and it's not a guarantee that we will um, select you as a speaker. But for it's always pre the conference is always on President's Day weekend, which is mid February. So pretty much in March we start looking at who we want for 2024. So and if you want to come, hmm. We'll explore it. I won't get too deep into it, but um, send me, uh, I'll send you an email once Jim gives me your email address. You fill out the presenter interest form. I'll take a look at it. And then, um, I mean, we might be able to squeeze you in, but we already turned in the badges, all the badges information to Jim. Yeah. So we're kind of too late for this year. I, I'm enthusiastic, but I have to hold myself yeah, back. Yeah, you, you usually start, what, about nine to 12 months ahead of time starting yeah. to line up speakers and keynotes and all that i had the stuff. keynoters for this year back in you know march of last year yeah that's what i don't I have any for next year though and one thing we should probably mention that we haven't touched upon yet is that for 2024 drafted digital is going to give away a free San Francisco yes. Writers Conference conference registration a $900 yes. value yeah baby so yeah, that's, that's going to be great. Anybody can enter it. It's fantastic. I'm psyched for it. Yeah, me too. Me too. We're we're putting together the little conference or the contest details about how we'll um, give that away. But I am super excited about that, and I'm super excited about the conference. Three yeah. weeks away. I can't believe me it. Too. I know. I know. Believe me. I woke up this morning. I'm like, oh my god. I'm starting to have dread and despair. Oh, it must be three weeks before the conference. Dread and despair. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of things I haven't done that I need that's to do. That's one way to. Yeah. That's good way. Good job selling the conference, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but you know i want to touch on that point that you just made i mean we are san francisco is a really expensive city and 90 percent of what we collect in attendance uh, registrations goes to the hotel so we have to charge a lot of money and we feel bad about that because hey we're west coast so we're always touchy-feely trying to get everybody involved yeah. at some level so we have scholarships um check out the sfwriters.org that's our website. And uh, right now we had eight scholarship winners already. We picked them in December. So check that out. We have a um, writing contest and everybody who enters gets to be in the print anthology and you get a copy of it. Mm -hmm. And the winner of that writing contest um, mm -hmm. gets a free registration to come to the conference. So scholarships for free registration, anthology for free registration. We have volunteers. We use 60 to 70 volunteers. And um, 
there's a form on our about us page way down at the bottom where you can uh, sign up to be a volunteer. It's too late for this year, but um, for 2024, February. So those are all ways you can come to the conference for free. Volunteers have to work half time and then the other half time they get to go to any sessions they want. And you get access, free access to all the recorded sessions. So you really get the whole conference uh, for volunteering. Our volunteers are fantastic. We they could are. not do this There's conference without some of them. the best in the business. And I can tell you that with complete confidence because I go to a lot of conferences and have gone yeah, to a lot you of conferences do. every year. <laughs> and super pro all the way through the entire event. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Okay, we, and we have we some are, of our volunteers are, you know, pros for um, you know, they are PR pros, they are book editors, oh, yeah. they're oh, and we have a whole bunch of Indian. We have 15 agents coming. 25 editors and and about 10 of those i think are what we call indie editors mm -hmm. there's acquiring editors who want to buy your book and and produce it for you indie editors you hire to um edit your work and um we got all of them coming and they're all so excited and they're all going to be offering the free consultations but also they're sitting at ask a pro tables and they're sitting at lunch and they're sitting at breakfast all three days have, or four days have breakfast or actually thursday doesn't so friday saturday sunday breakfast mm -hmm. you sit down there's an agent there there's an editor there you talk to them you know that's a whole hour um, right. Although don't pitch your book for an hour to me because I will <laughs> get up and leave. <laughs> one thing I would like to mention, because we're at time, but one thing I would like to mention is that for any author that goes to a writer's conference and that it's full of agents and editors and publishers, and you are have already decided that you're going to go down the self-publishing path for your career, I would still highly encourage you to speak with editors and speak with agents because you are going to learn things that you didn't know that you didn't know. And it's just going to fill your brain with um, more information and more knowledge and more best practices about the industry in which you are joining. So take in all we, the information. We listed our schedule yesterday. So that's up online, sfwriters.org. Yep. Um, all the speakers and links to all their bios are up and there. There's a banner. Yep. Ton oh, fantastic tons of information and we hope you want to come and you could do the master classes if you don't want to do the full conference that will definitely help you out so anyway right. jim thank you so much for having me on here Lori, thanks a million for being here and for those of you who are listening or watching um, our apologies for the early technical issues um, but we hope you'll join us uh, bookmark ddd dot live ddd live or just do a Google search on self-publishing insiders. There is a link. My team is awesome. They're like, Jim's going to drop the ball. <laughs> we've, we've got his back. <laughs> but we appreciate you being here. Laurie, thanks again for telling us all about the San, Francisco's Writers, the San Francisco Writers Conference. I can't wait to see you in three weeks. For everybody else, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for joining. See you next time.